Thank you, Dr. Vukic. Dr. Robert Lingua is a clinical professor of ophthalmology at the University of California, Irvine. His presentation is titled, Evolution of the Augmented Sinsky Extirpation Procedure for Nystagmus. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ed. The authors have no relevant financial disclosures, and the material uh, in detail has been submitted for publication to the journal Ophthalmology. Over 50 years ago, innovator Bob Sinsky operated several children with congenital cataracts who had already developed nystagmus. In an effort to improve their vision, he consulted with orthopedic surgeons who advised him to remove the offending muscles as had been done for spasticity. So he devised an operation using an enucleation snare to extirpate the anterior horizontal rectus muscle. In 2000, the patient on the left demonstrates a pendular nystagmus. In the center, two years post-op, his eyes are quiet. And on the right, we see Bob's home video of the 10-year follow-up. His vision improved to where he could finish college, attend medical school, and is practicing in Virginia. In 2012, when I first saw these videos, I had a patient who had persistent nystagmus after two traditional surgeries. And with Dr. Sinsky, I performed my first extirpation procedure in 2013. In the upper right, you'll see that at two years post-op, his nystagmus is quieted, he's maintained fair ocular rotation, and his vision improved from 2060 to 2025 and can now secure a driver's license. I was so impressed that I began to offer this procedure to younger patients. And here's a two-year-old with a ballistic nystagmus, horizontal and vertical strabismus, no null point. And on the right, one year later, has quiet eyes with a small face turn, but she can fuse and attend normal schools. But an enucleation snare is an imprecise ophthalmic instrument. It risks bleeding or significant strabismus. So Dr. Sinsky and my chairman, Dr. Steinert, encouraged me to refine the procedure, and over the last two and a half years, an augmented version of the Sinsky anterior extirpation procedure has been in evolution at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. At this time, the augmentation seeks to accomplish the following. To replace snare excision with a measured myectomy, to replace compression of the muscle stump with a controlled cautery, an idea given to me by Ed Wilson, my strabologist contemporary in South Carolina, preserve the attachment of the muscle stump to the intermuscular septum for enhanced ocular rotation, and if desired, leave a non-absorbable suture either for adjustment or relocation of the muscle stump. In the following short video, you see that the myectomy resembles a large resection. And here we're using a 5-0 mersaline placed at the desired point of excision. The muscle is clamped and then serially cauterized with adapted right angle instrumentation to control for hemostasis, and then the anterior section of the muscle is removed. So while the extirpation is fairly straightforward, where the strabologist is challenged is in managing strabismus without attached horizontal recti. After removal, the stump of the muscle is seen in the intermuscular sleeve, and the mersaline suture or a new suture can be used to sew the two lips of the sleeve shut to prevent anterior migration and reattachment to the globe. Post-op, the nystagmus dampening can take 8 to 12 weeks, as seen in this representative nystagmograph, where at one month, the nystagmus is still present, but at the third and 15th month exam, is quieted uh, relative to the preoperative tracing. Here are three examples of patients who underwent the augmented version of the extirpation. And in the upper left, you see a small pendular nystagmus without a null point, and in the upper right, eight weeks later, you see that she's able to maintain quiet fixation in primary. In the center panel is another patient with a higher amplitude, higher frequency nystagmus. 
And again, after extirpation at the eight-week interval, he is also now able to maintain quiet fixation and a fair degree of ocular rotation. And again, in the lower left, a patient with combined esotropia and nystagmus is now able to maintain quiet fixation, again with a small face turn, and has improved vision as well. We have operated 31 patients to date, and our present aim is to identify the ideal amount of muscle to remove that optimizes nystagmus reduction and an increase in acuity, yet preserve ocular rotation and good alignment. Until then, please consider these data proof of concept only. Well, here's where we get to the fun part. Not only do we have a new way to quiet nystagmus, but this operation has led to a challenge of traditional thinking in three ways. First, what is the relationship between nystagmus and vision? Here is a child with albinism, foveal hypoplasia on OCT, but has been reported by Gail Summers and others, that foveal hypoplasia is still consistent with vision of 2030 and no nystagmus. So when we see another patient who has albinism and a flat OCT, but he has 2100 acuity and nystagmus, traditional thinking would say he's stuck there. But in the lower video, after extirpation, now he has a return to null point. He has 2060 distance and 2030 near. That means we have to rethink our pronouncements in children with foveal hypoplasia and nystagmus. A flat macula does not presage a poor result from nystagmus surgery. In fact, almost 60% of the patients in our series experience an increase in acuity when the eyes are quiet regardless of concurrent ocular pathology, including congenital cataracts, aniridia, colobomas, ROP, and albinism. But the majority of acuity improvement is seen in children under the age of 10. So we have to operate these children while they're visually immature. Now the second challenge. What about the theory of ocular rotation? In traditional mechanics, a force around a fulcrum to a lever arm will move an object. Similarly, in eye pulley theory, the posterior extraocular muscle engages a pulley at the intermuscular septum, and the anterior portion of the muscle moves the globe. But in these procedures, we're extirpating the lever arm. So after we sequester the muscle stump, of this left medial rectus to the intermuscular septum, you can see in the video that at six days postoperatively, that left medial rectus is able to fully adduct the globe. In fact, in the lower video, even at one day, despite some soreness and tearing, the patient is able to perform ocular rotations. So it's back to the drawing board to explain eye movement. Perhaps the third exciting challenge here may be that there's a separate neurology for voluntary saccades versus involuntary saccades. So here in the upper left, we see a patient with a brisk nystagmus being asked to track a target moving back and forth. Well, she can't do it. In the lower left now, with quiet eyes, she's able to perform induced saccades to the right and then back to center. So why are unwanted, involuntary nystagmus saccades dampened by the procedure, but the ability to generate a voluntary saccade left intact? I look forward to trying to provide some answer to these questions in the coming years. But for now, being able to quieten a nystagmus more powerfully than traditional surgery has also opened doors to future research and understanding of eye movement dynamics and foveal function. And now I'd like to make a few acknowledgments and thank you. Uh, first to Ed Wilson, if he's in the room, it's great to have one other strabologist in the room that we can confer with. But especially to my friend and mentor and chairman, Dr. Roger Steinert, who's here in the front row with his lovely wife, April, 
Uh, without his support, this research would have never gained traction at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. Uh, and most importantly, I'm, I'm proud to see Dr. Bob Sinsky in the front row, who after an extended career still manages to innovate and instigate, and I wish him another 90 years of being an inspiration to us all.